Are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Joe Dillette uh, from the wood carving shop in Salmonac, Illinois. Uh, this is part of the Master Arts series made possible through the uh, Sunrise Rotary Club of Naperville. Uh, Joe, it's all up to you now. Take over. Thank you, Barry. It's really an honor to be here, Barry, and I really appreciate the invitation and uh, for you lovely folks that show it up. And uh, what I plan on doing is doing just a demonstration, and uh, it's going to be very informal. So just ask questions, interrupt me as I'm going along, and I'll feel like I'm at home. You know. <laughs> so. Okay. What I would like to demonstrate is uh, a relief card. So there's several types of carving. There's uh, uh, relief carving, there's carving in the round, like that portrait there, uh, and then there's chip carving, and then there's variations on some of those. Uh, basically what I do is relief carving and carving in the round. So for relief carving is what I probably do uh, maybe 80% of my time. I specialize in relief carving on mantles, and we'll talk about that later on. But right now I want to give a demonstration of how to do relief carving. So first I start off with a pattern. I draw a pattern and then I transfer that pattern to the wood. And there's several ways. I find a nice way to do it because I wanted to create a pattern here that was reversible. And uh, so uh, some of these are reversible. I guess one is one way, one is the other. I use the graphite uh, on one side, I turn this paper over, it's a tracing paper, I trace it on the other side right onto the wood, and that then creates the, uh, uh, the gra graphite's transferred right to the wood. The wood I'm working with here is basswood, and basswood is primarily the wood that's used in uh, Sweden and uh, Austria. Uh, many carvers here in the U.S. use basswood, it's known as lime wood. Uh, in Europe and uh, so basswood is a nice carving wood it's soft it's got nice fine grain I don't use basswood very often for the mantles because I like a hardwood the dark ones are the black walnut uh, this is butternut butternut is pretty soft uh, then I, I use pine pine and the softer woods like butternut is more difficult to hold the detail uh, basswood has a nice fine grain you can hold the detail in basswood, but not as good as you can in black walnut. So black walnut is my favorite. So in Germany and the black forest, mostly what they carve is black walnut. So and we are blessed in this country to really have an abundance of wood. Uh, in Europe, it's almost rationed. You know, wood is a scarce commodity there. And uh, so anyway, let's get started here. What I I'm going to demonstrate is first I start with the pattern. After I get it transferred. Then the first step that I do is I ground out the background like this. So what I'm going to do is I'll start doing that. I use the traditional chisels and mallets. Uh, here's my carving tools. And uh, so these are the normal chisels that they use, the traditional carvers use. And if you've seen a trained carver trained in Europe that's trained formally, what they do normally is they're laying their chisels out on the bench. There's no particular order, but they're laid out fairly neat, and they just select the chisels that they need for their work, and they lay them out like this on the bench. So if you see someone looking, you know, with all their chisels pointed towards them, that is a carver that you could say he's formally trained in Europe. If the chisels are pointing away, like that, then you could assume they're, they're formally trained in uh, uh, like uh, Japan or in China. That's how they train their carvers. But they lay the tools out on the bench. So that's the way that uh, most carvers that are formally trained. Also what carvers do, the formally trained carvers, they do tool specific carving. So uh, that means they select the shape of the tool for the shape that they're carving. So some of the differences that you'll see in the U.S. here is in the U.S. we generally start off with a, uh, uh, a stop cut. The stop cut is the, is the cut that you make right around your line so you're outlining your pattern. What you're doing is you're actually stopping 
cutting the wood, when you're taking down this background, you're actually protecting that leaf. So you're stopping the wood from splitting in, and that's why it's called a stop cut. Now the main differences between us in the U.S. and Europe is in Europe, most of the time the stop cut is made with a vein. The difference in the veiner and the V-tool that I'm using is the V-tool actually comes to a sharp V. A veiner is a tool, let me pull out a larger, just gouge so you can see the radius, but it's got the radius with the sides uh, coming up on it, and it's smaller than this. But what the Europeans try to achieve by that, it's, it creates a softer line, but it looks like that relief is growing up from the background. So that's one of the main differences you'll see between relief carving here in the U.S. and the relief carving in Europe. Uh, we here in the U.S. like to create a sharp line. We even like to do undercutting because we want that thing just to stand out and uh, almost jump off the wood. We like a dynamic thing. What they like in Europe is they like to show that it all comes from one piece of wood and it just grew out of the background. So there is as much softer looking normally and uh, so you will hardly ever see a European carver using a V-tool. The other thing is if they take a V-tool and they're putting in hair details or something, uh, they normally take those lines that they're creating. If they're creating a series of lines and they leave them as lines like this, they uh, say all you're doing is drawing. You're not really carving. So you, you want to create a shape there. So you want to take one of those sides, the lines that you create, and you want to shape it. So you're actually creating a shape more than just a line. So a lot of carving in the U.S. will have this line type of carving, and in Europe they'll have more of the shape carving. So let's go back and work on this background a little bit. And I'm taking the V-tool, and I'm cutting around the line, outlining creating my stop cut. Now normally I stand in front of the bench and work, but uh, this is working just about as good, well, so you can kind of see what I'm doing. So I've created the stop cut around that leaf. Now to cut the background down, one of the things they hardly ever do in European carving is they never bury the wings of the, of the chisel. So what they would do for this year, taking this background down, they would select the gouge that has got a fairly deep sweep to it, nice curve, keep the wings out and not tear the wood. So they would remove the background like that. What I like to do, is bury the wings, <laughs> do it different. But I bury one wing and I use the tool to split that wood and use the grain, split it like that. So I bury one of the wings down in and cut right up to that stop cut. Okay, so that's, that's how I work the background down. That way I can take a smaller gouge and I can make a pretty big cut. Even if I had a small gouge like this, I can still make a pretty nice cut on there by splitting, splitting off some pretty big pieces with a little gouge. So I keep one of the wings out on the outside and let it split into that stop cut. In Europe, the uh, tool specific carving is where they'll select a chisel with the curve that they're trying to uh, uh, duplicate and they do a plunge cut like this. In Europe they almost always use just a heavy mallet. You'll hardly see a mallet this size in their hand because what they do is when they're doing this plunge cut they want to, they can say you get a lot better control with one hit getting the same depth of that cut, rather than taking a small, you know, you have to hit it several times, you don't have as much control over the depth of that cut. 
So that's what they're doing when they say tool specific. Is they match the curve of what they're carving to the chisel. thing that you should never do is pry with the tool. The tool is quite strong, but it's very brittle. Uh, it's very strong in this direction, but as far as prying, there's almost no strength to these tools. So you'll end up breaking your uh, chisels quite easily that way. Okay, what I do is I keep alternating between, you know, as I get down to the stop, bottom of the stop cut, and if I want to go deeper, then I have to re-outline uh, again the get the stop cut deeper. Then I ground the background down and I keep alternating the grounding the background down and the stop cuts till I'm down to the depth that I want to achieve. So once I've got the depth that I want to achieve, so this step that we just completed here, we didn't complete. <laughs> I said I was going to lie, but that's okay. <laughs> but this is called layer. So the difference in this simple pattern and this relief carving here is when you're doing the layering operation on here, you actually take, you layer, and I like to work from the deepest side out. Most carvers do that. Uh, but I go to the deepest, and that's my deep layer. Then I layer this next layer, and I layer it all the way out. So I kind of plan the whole carving by layers. So incidentally, this is another type of relief carving. And uh, this one is called the pierced relief. Also do the layering, but your deepest areas, you go real deep. until you go right out and through it. So that's called a pierced relief. And uh, the thing that I like to do when I'm, the reason why I like using chisels in the traditional way is this texture. This texture is really what adds the life to the carving. And I like, to, uh, you know, I have some students and I like them to be able to use these chisels and imagine they're just like the painter's brush and they're putting in textures and tones. And uh, so I like to alternate different types of textures. And one will play off the other and that's what gives it the contrast. So besides the depth and the shadow. So, uh, I'm, I'm really heavily in the texturing, so. Okay, back to here. So the next step then, after we get the layering done, is to start the contouring. So the contouring, again, I go back and get a V-tool. A European carver would probably pick up a veiner again to get that nice radius. That's the difference. The veiner has got a radius on the bottom where this is a sharp point on the bottom bottom of the V tool. But I'll outline, now I'm outlining the acorns. And what I want to do is create a leaf that isn't flat. So I want to get some curve to the leaf. So let's say this leaf here, I want to make it different than this one. So this one, I want to make the center vein deep and come out with the outside leaf. chose a large V tool, one of the rules of thumb is you only bury that tool about a third of the way down. And uh, so I'm about a third of the depth. I like a nice uh, deep cuts and uh, I like to do carving fairly fast. to create a little bit of interest, I think I'll take the top of this leaf, these points, and I'll just roll them off a little bit. Maybe roll that point down, just to create a little interest there. And uh, I want to cut the center deeper, just to get a little deeper shadow.
So after you do the layering, this step here is called the contouring. So now you do your contouring, which is the second step in doing relief carving. The last step is going to be adding the details, and we'll be getting to that. Um, there was something I was going to say about this. Oh, yes. Let's go back and talk about a little bit of the sharpening of the tools. Wood carving tools are really sharp and different uh, than what lathe tools are. They're more perpendicular on the end. And traditionally, we're taught as wood carvers that the inside edge here is the cutting edge. So the tool is sharpened from the outside. Now, one of the things that a tool like this here will work a lot better for is if you put a little bit of a bevel on the inside, that tool is, then can be made to use in both directions. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to contour this uh, acorn here, and I want to use this tool upside down to pick out a tool that will just about match the curve that I want to create. So that's this tool-specific carving. So by putting a little bit, a slight bevel, you can hardly notice it, but it's generally caused from when I lap the tool. I lap the outside. This leather has got abrasive on it. So just like the old barber's razor strap, there's a half micron abrasive in this green buffet compound. That's how to achieve that razor sharp edge. This buffing compound is really what does the polishing of that edge. So you can put this on a buffing wheel, you can put it on anything, even a piece of cardboard, and uh, buff a piece of metal. And in this case, we're buffing that edge to a razor sharp finish. Now to get the inside, I buff the outside straight away like this, like on a flat surface. But to get the inside, I curve the leather, and I go like that. The leather is a soft material, so over time what I'm doing is not maintaining a real flat area. I'm getting a little bevel as that leather is just going off the end of the tool. It's ever so slight, but if you look at it in the light, you can see it's just curved off. But it's just enough to be able to use this tool upside down like that to create that roundness of that acorn. So that's... Uh, little helpful hint there. So if you get a brand new chisel, like you buy a Swiss chisel from Woodcraft Supply, uh, and they uh, come pre-sharpened, and uh, there is no bevel in the inside. And you say, well, I'm going to turn that thing over and use it like this. You're going to find it very difficult to use uh, because it doesn't have that bevel in the inside. The other thing is, is that when you get a new chisel, it's rare for chisels to come Sharpen. So when somebody buys a set of chisels or they get a set for Christmas, they think it's brand new and it's ready to go. The chisels aren't. And they get discouraged. The tools have to be razor sharp. And uh, that's the most important thing in wood carving. Uh, and they, uh, I mean, they literally have to be so sharp that you can shave with them. And normally they don't come that way. Now, Woodcraft is the one that imports the Swiss chisels, and they do it as a courtesy to their customers. But other people, if you don't request it, you're going to get it unsharpened. And the reason why they do that is every carver sharpens their tools differently. So they don't expect to be the way you sharpen them to be the way that, that you're going to use them if they sharpen them. So that's why you're going to have to learn how to sharpen your own tools. Now, most carvers, or some carvers will say, that the bevel has to be straight on the back side. And a lot of carvers use it that way. If you see a uh, carver sharpening his tool, let's set this up to the side here so you can kind of see this demonstration. But they'll set the chisel up like this on the angle, and they hold that bevel almost vertical. And they take that stone, and this is what they're doing for their sharpening. That is a carver that probably was trained in Europe. He's formally trained. That's how they hold that bevel. Many European carvers will keep that bevel straight. Now, if you look at all my tools, I've got a radius on that. The reason why I like the radius on there is, well, first of all, that radius comes naturally from the leather because the leather's soft as a buffing material. 
So when you're buffing, you're pressing down, but the leather being soft is embedded in like this, and eventually you're gonna shape the back of that tool like the softness of the leather. But I like that because, first of all, I'm not a slave to keeping that thing straight. The other th reason why I like it is that bevel then becomes the fulcrum of my lever when I'm carving. I can control the depth of my cut by just a little bit of adjustment here. If I had a straight bevel, I couldn't control the depth until I hit the fulcrum of the lever right at the, at the end of the bevel. So then, by then, you're quite a ways away from the tip, and that tip is going to be moving quite rapidly. You don't have that microscopic control that if you had a great gradual taper. Okay, so we're in the process of contouring this. Welcome. Thank you. Contouring this uh, carving here. And you see, every time that I hit the tool with the mallet, it creates a line. You can see how many times I hit the chisel by how many lines there are. That's what I call a pound line. And the reason for that is every time I hit that chisel, I've got a little different angle on the chisel. So it's cutting in a little different direction. So when you go to finish up, the carver will generally take the chisel and push it by hand to smooth off that area. That gets rid of the pound lines, takes the tool marks out is really what we're doing. We're kind of planing the surface down by hand. So let's talk about some of the different lengths of tools. This is a full-size chisel. This is about the longest that the carvers use. They have a European size that's shorter than this. Uh, and then they also have palm chisels. If you're starting off carving, I recommend you get the full size. Because the full size is easier to put both hands on the chisel to control it while you're pushing it through the wood. My power is coming from this hand. And I'm actually working the two hands against each other as I'm pushing through the wood. So I'm pushing back with this hand, and that's kind of how I get my control, and I'm getting my depth because of my reference point here. At the same time, you should be able to do it in the other direction. That's what they call carving right-handed and carving left-handed. So the same way, this hand now is down, and this hand is supplying the power. Okay, let's contour this other leaf different. Let's keep the center point high and bring the other two sides down. So you, you see how I use the grain of the wood to split everything down that way. Now coming up this side, if I was to come down this way, it would split right through the high point that I'm trying to keep here. So I come back up the other direction. Now I see the results that I have, and it's not as dynamic as I would like it to look. It's fairly flat. I can see that now even before I level it off. So I want to create, at least on this side, I want to create a contour as it goes down. So I'll just do tool specific carving. This is about the curve that I want to get. So I'm going to come down right on this side. Creates a little bit sharper line here. Now I think I'm ready to push by hand to level it off. And I just want the, the sharp line on this side as it cast a shadow down. This side I'm going to keep a little bit rounded or maybe even convex it a little bit. These curves are all different and they're numbered. The number one chisel is a straight chisel, like a carpenter's chisel. There's no radius at all. The number three has got a slight radius to it. And the higher the number goes, like this one here is a number uh, eight. 
that's got a fairly tight radius. Now it doesn't relate to the radius. I mean, there isn't a specific radius for a number. What it is, the number is related to the depth of the center versus the wings on the outside. So actually a number eight will change its radius depending on its width. So the ratio of the depth to the height of the wings is what it's judged at. So if you're doing tool specific carving, that's important to know that. Because if I take this, uh, let's go back and pull out a, another one here. Let's say this is a number, uh, number four. Fairly good radius on that. If I put out, pull out a number uh, three, that's narrower, and I'll put those two right together, and right at that one point on the bottom, they are the same radius. So, uh, it's just the ratio of the wings on here to the depth is much less. So, uh, it's that ratio. So now if you're doing tool specific carving and matching a curve, it's good to know that. If you don't have exactly the right one, a number three, you know that, or a number four rather, you know you can take a shorter number three and create the same radius. So, you can write that down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a test. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so I want to get my V-tool and create some uh, stop cuts here so I can contour those acorns. any questions, just uh, holler as I'm going here. We can field questions as we go. I'll just do a little... Okay, so we've done the layout and grounded out the background. We've done the contouring and now comes time for the detailing. Let's take this one here and detail it. Now the first thing that I'm going to do here with the detail is I'm going to put the uh, cross hatching on the cap of the acorn. And so what you first want to do is go with the hardest cut. The hardest cut is the one that goes across grain the most. Because I'm going to take the V tool and I'm going to make that hardest cut. The easiest one is going to be coming down in this direction with the grain. The hardest one is going to be going across. The reason why you do that is if I made the easiest one first and then did the hardest one across grain, what would happen is I'd be chipping out the piece. So I'd, I'd be in danger of losing my uh, uh, the points on that cross hatch. So, uh, Done them in one direction, and I'll come down and do them in the other direction. And then I will put the veins in the leaf. why I'm stopping halfway down on this cut in is because if I continue it would split off. So I have to go to the bottom of the cut and then come from the other side. Now what's left on that is the cleanup. So that's where the apprentice comes in. <laughs> no, I don't have an apprentice. <laughs> so the cleanup is done by taking the tools and you're pushing them in, getting the tool marks out so it's hand work by pushing. Now the other thing that I like 
to do is uh, I use scrapers quite a bit. And I'll make a scraper, they have the commercial scrapers with the flexible steel and that that you can burnish a nice edge on there and uh, shave off, uh, rather than sand, really shave off quite a bit of wood. And it's a really good way to, to finish. Uh, you can take simple things like uh, cheap putty knives and take those putty knives and grind it to any shape that you want and just get in there and scrape with that. And if you don't have the right shape, it just takes a minute on the grinder to reshape it. So when, I, when you're cutting with a putty knife uh, or making a scraper, you make that cut perpendicular on the end, and then you leave a heavy burr on there. And now you can get in there and you can scrape your tool marks out if, if you want to remove your tool marks. Uh, in the beginning, when wood carvers start, they tend to get discouraged because people say, you should never use sandpaper on your, on your work. And I know when I started, I didn't have all these tools. I didn't have all the knowledge and the technique to make certain cuts. So I didn't worry about it. I just got as close as I could with the tools I had, and then I took my sandpaper and I bent it, and I went in there and I just ground it out of there, you know, to get the shape that I wanted. At least I was carving, and eventually I picked up those techniques of how to make those cuts. And uh, that's what a beginner carver should do. I like to teach there is no rules. And so just get in there and do whatever you need to do to get the wood out, you know. So if you don't have the right tool or the technique, get it done with whatever you got at hand. Uh, any more with the demonstration? Any questions on that? Yeah. I didn't hear what type of wood you use. Uh, this is basswood that I'm using here. Basswood is not my favorite wood. I have it around because it's good for a beginner carver to use soft wood, which basswood is soft wood. Uh, I, the softer the wood, the sharper the tool has to be. So the hardest thing for a new carver to learn is how to sharpen the tools. I say that's 99% of carving is sharpening tools. So if the tool isn't sharp and they're given a piece of soft wood, first of all, the soft wood is easier to carve, providing their tool is sharp. So if they can't get the tool sharp, they're going to be tearing that piece of basswood up. So if you go and you watch a guy cutting, uh, like somebody will see me cutting black walnut, and they'll say, oh, that's black walnut, that's hard, that, that, you know, that chisel it must be really sharp. You can do that with a dull chisel. Uh, if you went to your kitchen to cut a tomato, you want the sharpest knife in the kitchen to cut the tomato, but if you're chopping up a carrot, any old knife will do. You know? so, and the carrot doesn't care, it looks the same whether you use a sharp knife or a dull one. Well, the same with the soft wood. It'll mush just like the tomato if you've got a dull tool. So uh, that's why I like to start students on the softwood like the basswood. And basswood is typically what's used. Nice fine grain, holds detail very nice. Paints up real well, finishes real well. You ever use Tupelo? Yes, I have used Tupelo, yes. Uh, that's also a nice softwood. Tupelo is used by bird carvers a lot. Uh, they make decoys. And, uh, the softwoods like uh, the basswood and tupelo uh, burn real well. Uh, I don't mean burn in fire, they do that too, but they use wood burners. The reason why they use wood burning so much in wood carving is because they need lines very close together. You know how lines, <laughs> how the close lines on the quills of a feather are? They're just so close. Now, when you take a knife and you make a cut, what you're doing is you're actually pushing the fibers away. You're not removing material. You're pushing those fibers away. Now, if you put another cut right next to it, you push those fibers away. Now you've taken two cuts very close together, and you've bent those fibers both ways. Chances are you've fractured them, and they're going to fall out of them. So because of the pressure, the wedge of the knife going into it. So what a wood burner does is you sharpen that blade, or the burning tip of the wood burner, just like a knife. It's that sharp. But instead of applying pressure, you're actually removing the wood by burning. You're not forcing the fibers aside. So they have the different tips, but they'll go in there and they burn every one of those quills in the feather. That's all detail work. So when you see the prices that they get for these things, sometimes you wonder, how can they sell them for that price? They're only getting two, two cents an hour, you know? <laughs> because, but it's the love that they have. <coughs> so that's the wood burning. Tupelo burns very well. Basswood burns very well. Nice tight grain, and uh, so that's why uh, the bird carvers like that. So, the Joe, long answer, and I like long answers. I do too. <laughs> yeah. Joe, can you give us a uh, step-by-step -step procedure in sharpening a, a tool that you may have just bought 
from a sculpture house or uh, wood. Sure. Does anybody have any pocket knife here that they'd like to have sharpened? Oh, the Swiss Army knife. You know, years ago, far back as I can remember, everybody had a pocket knife. You know? How times change, you know? So, mm -hmm. Okay. It needs sharpening. Yes. Yes, it does. So there's three steps that I do uh, in sharpening. And when you buy a new set of tools, you'll probably have to go through the three steps. The first step is a coarse stone. Now you look at this stone and you say, what kind of stone is that? I like to show how cheap you can get by. Don't spend a lot of money. There's a lot of sharpening systems out there. And the mistake carvers make is they can't sharpen on a stone like this or on a hand strap like that. So what they do is they go out and buy, I'll buy a $200 system. Now I'll be able to sharpen, and they still can't sharpen. Maybe I'll buy this $500 system. Now these are all good systems, but if you don't understand the principle of sharpening, they are, they, there's none of them going to work for you. So the first thing you do is you take a coarse stone. Now this is an oil stone, and the oil that you use should be a honing oil. If you don't have honing oil, then use a mineral oil. But don't use a lubricating oil. Now some people say, oh, I use WD-40. That works fine. Well, it takes you longer, though. Anything like WD-40 or uh, a lubricating oil puts a film on the, pea, on the stone. It wants to keep friction low, so it's made to put a film on. Now you've got to scratch through that film in order to get at that stone. Honing oil doesn't put that film on, and mineral oil doesn't. But don't use a vegetable oil or, or anything that with a protein in because your stone will turn rancid. Now you don't need a nice flat stone. Uh, I picked this up for maybe 50 cents at a garage sale. And the coarse stone, uh, normally you keep your stones covered so the dirt doesn't get on there. But a coarse stone doesn't make any difference. If any sand falls on, it'll probably help the stone out. So. Uh, there really isn't any real scientific uh, approach. In other words, people say, oh, you should count how many strokes on one side and count on the other. It doesn't make any difference. All I do, and it doesn't make any difference what direction. You can go away from the cutting edge, towards the cutting edge, or in a circular motion. I'm holding that knife at about a 10 degree angle. I'm going in a circular motion. And once you raise a burr, then that's as sharp as that stone is going to get. It. We don't have it there yet. Let me put it down here. I can put some pressure. I put a lot of pressure on with my finger. So I'm probably putting maybe 20, 30 pounds pressure down. And I'm scrubbing this knife on the stone holding that knife at about a 10 degree angle. A chisel now, you want to hold it at a higher angle, maybe a 25 degree angle. Okay, there's a burr that, if you want to feel it, it's rolled right over on this, hooked to one side. Mm -hmm. Now the difference between sharpening a kitchen knife and sharpening a tool like this here that let's assume this is going to be for uh, woodworking is for woodworking it has to be perfect all the way across. I can feel a burr continuous all the way across the edge. For a kitchen knife if you have one or two nicks in there that hunk of meat ain't going to care or the pickle or cucumber you're cutting up. But a piece of wood does care because you, if you ever had a chisel that's cutting along real nice and all of a sudden you see this white streak follow behind the chisel. You say, boy, it's still cutting nice. Nice chip coming off of there. And you envision, because you got a nick in there, that your that white streak is a little hump that you got going there. It isn't a hump. What's happening is that is grabbing the fibers, that not that nick, grabbing the fibers and it's pulling them from below the surface. And so you're digging a trench in there is what you're doing. So you say, well, I don't care because I'm going to sand and that's going to go away. Well, you're going to create other scratches on there. You're going to camouflage it, but you're probably not going to sand as deep as that little streak was. So what's going to happen then is you aren't going to be able to see that where you dug that trench in with that nick. 
and you're going to put the finish on, and all of a sudden, boom, the finish run into that uh, groove, and it made it much darker. Now you can see that scratch. So it's important in a chisel that you have all the nicks off of there. So that's why you feel across the edge, make sure that that burr goes along the whole edge. After that, then you go to a medium stone. The medium stone would be like your hard Arkansas stone. Now the Japanese water stones are also good. All these products work very well. Uh, the reason why the Japanese water stone works really fast is because this is a hard surface. When you put the two hard surfaces together, you only got a couple points that are hitting. So you have to move it around, scrub it around, to try to get the whole surface ground out. That's enough work on this here stone. If it was my knife, I'd spend more time on <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I should have. I still feel a little bit of a burr. I light. We do a little bit more. So, to finish the thought on the Japanese water stones, when you're using those, you're putting water on the top. So you put a little water and you pat your hand on top and you start cutting and you're creating a mud on this top surface. And now that's a slurry and you want to keep that on. And uh, you, you don't want to even clean it off after you're done sharpening because you like that slurry on for next time. But with that mud on the top, now when you're sharpening it isn't just two hard surfaces together. You've actually got a mud that's making contact across more of the surface. So you're actually going to be removing stock quicker with a Japanese water stone. So that was a ceramic stone that I used. And ceramic or diamond doesn't need to have lubricant on it. This is a diamond stone here. Uh, and what you do is after the stone loads up, loading up means that the metal from the uh, knife has embedded itself into the abrasive has built itself up to the top of the abrasive and the stone will no longer cut, it just looks shiny. So when that happens to the ceramic or to the diamond, you just put it in uh, soap and water and just wash it off and it'll clean itself out. So, uh, but an oil stone doesn't clean itself out that easily, so uh, neither does a Japanese water stone. I don't recommend you spend a lot of money, I'm not selling these things. <laughs> I'll be selling less from now on. <laughs> Uh, this, this diamond stone, this was given to me because I was demonstrating it. Uh, so the factory rep gave it to me and I said, you know, I, I still I wouldn't recommend it because some of the small tools like this, they drop down in between the abrasive. It's hard to hold the angle on those. Okay, and so, uh, you know, and it's, this is over a hundred bucks for a stone like this, you know, so it's, uh, ceramic is what way I'd go. Uh, even you're checking out of the hardware store and on the end you see a little hard Arkansas stone about that big, you know, what are they, a buck fifty? That's, that's a good buy. Get one of those and that's all you need. You saw how long I used it. Uh, it doesn't take long. So most of your work on the stone when you're starting off with a dull tool is on the course. Once you get that burr raised, that's as sharp as that stone's going to get it. You go to the next step, just knock that burr off. Now you're ready for the leather strap. The secret to the leather strap is first of all, you rub a, this buffing compound, which has got a half micron abrasive. It's got some waxes and oils in there that help hold it onto the leather. You just rub that all over the surface. And then, just like the old barber does with his barber strap, that's how you sharpen the edge. Um, the mistake that people make when they're sharpening on the leather strap is they hold that same 10 degree angle. That's the most common mistake. You have to remember that this leather is a soft material. So the soft material is going to embed itself in and as that pressure is relieved it's actually going to be buffing up in this direction. So what you really need is to hold that knife almost flat onto the surface. So when that does raise up it's maybe at about that same 10 degree angle. Otherwise, if you hold that 10 degree angle, you're going to buff that edge right off. The other thing is, is they'll remember what the barber does, and he's going like this, you know. Of course, he's done that a zillion times, so he knows exactly what he's doing. But before he turns his wrist over, 
that razor is off of the strap. But the, the, the amateur carver will come across and he'll flip his wrist before he raises that leather, the, the knife off of the stock, and it'll take that edge right off. So you can get a real nice edge and come with one flip of the wrist and you've lost it. Because that's just a microscopic edge on you. So, okay, so now you just take, and I'm buffing the surface, I'm pressing quite hard on it, laying the knife almost flat going across the leather. Now the way I test it, is I ask for a volunteer. No. <laughs> I test it against thumbnail at about a 45 degree angle. Don't put any pressure, but see if it grabs, if it doesn't slide off the thumbnail. If that's the case, then it's razor sharp. Then you can shave yourself with it. That takes the hair right off your arm. <laughs> I remembered where I got the knife. Oh, well, thank you, sir. I got about five knives in this drawer here. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> okay. Another question is uh, a lot of beginning carvers do not know where to get their materials such as wood. Do you have any uh, wholesalers or places that you would recommend? Well, first of all, the internet is a great place to, to search for anything like that. Uh, but yes, the answer to the question is yes, and I'm glad you asked. <laughs> to sound like I'm selling something. But I teach at a place called the Hardwood Connection. They're up in Sycamore, Illinois. And that's a, uh, uh, where you can get wood up there. Also down in Morris, there's a hardwood dealer down there. So there's these specialty shops. In the Chicago area, you'll find Owl Lumber, you'll find Paxton. These people have that kind of lumber also. Uh, Pine Lumber is another one that has uh, more of the softwoods. But uh, you look on the internet, any place around the country, you're going to find suppliers of both the chisels and the wood. Wood carving has kind of gone high tech with the internet. I'm on the internet with about 600 carvers every day on there. And we can chat like we're family, you know, so. Uh, you guys and we all can, know each other. Huh? You guys all know each other. Yeah, we do. And then, <laughs> then the knob holds is another list that's on there that I participate in. So, yeah, there are, there are lists on there. And then because of this, there's a lot of opportunities. An opportunity that has just come to me is there's a new magazine coming out by All American Crafts. All American Crafts did a magazine, it was a craft magazine. They're a publisher out of New Jersey. And in there, uh, they like have three articles on wood carving. Well, there was a lot of interest in wood carving, they saw. So they created another magazine called Carving Magazine. And so I'm a columnist in that magazine, and uh, my column is called Ask Joe. So, uh, and you know, it says nothing about answers. <laughs> I'm collecting <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to talk about mammals a little bit. Mm -hmm. One more question. Okay. Uh, if people want to get involved with different societies or different clubs and carving, where can they go? How can you uh, steer them to different uh, demographic areas? Well, first of all, the magazine called Chip Chats. That's kind of like the Bible here. Uh, it's like a the big club publication, and that tells about all the clubs in the United States, where all the shows are, the events. There's a subscription, uh, I think they're up to 35,000 subscriptions in Chip Chats. You guys know? Yes. Yeah, they're about that. Yes. Uh, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Gallenstein out of Indiana has been the editor for years. He's done a tremendous job. It's a nonprofit. If they want to know uh, uh, the address for that, where they can call, or the phone number where they can subscribe, they can call me. I don't have that information handy here. But, uh, uh, wait, I think I do. Should I dig that up? Sure. I can give that phone number. There's another way, too. There's a woodworking show up at the Odeon that's held twice a year. And most of the local woodworking and carving clubs have exhibits. They'll show you everything they do. Sign you up if you want to be a member. Very good. Oh, yeah. I brought um, Joe, can I just say something? Yes. On this subject. Uh, we don't have a club, but we meet on Tuesday mornings at Ruben Center in Naperville. Yes. Very informal. Whoever wants to come, we usually get five, six dollars there. 
you're, a, you're a, a, car, a group of carvers. Yeah, beginners and maybe a little, some a little bit more advanced, but just very informal. Not, no club members, no dues, nothing like that. Just come there and Where is carve. Uh, right across from the Riverwalk on Jefferson. Oh, okay. Right down the street here. So the Reuben Center is at every Tuesday morning? Every Tuesday morning from 9 to uh, 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Yeah. Stay there all day. There you can get a weekly fix. Oh, yeah. 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 Nothing structured. The uh, phone number for the uh, uh, chip chats is uh, area code 513-561-0628. That'll get you at Gallenstein's office, and uh, it cost, I have written here $11 a year, but I think that's up to $12 now, isn't that? So it's $12 a year, you get six issues. Uh, it's a nice magazine. When this thing started out, I mean, they were started out on a shoestring, and it was like newsprint 35 years ago, you know? Uh, black and white, now it's uh, 150, 180 pages, all color, uh, beautiful. And uh, 35,000 subscriptions out there, and uh, that's their mailing, and it's really a uh, nice magazine. So I would really like to plug that, and uh, that'll give you the information of most of the clubs in the U.S. It'll give you the source for tools, that'll give you where the shows are at, and uh, any other questions? Now you can go show us your mantles. Okay, you talked about mantles. I use different types of wood for mantles. This is black walnut, butternut, which is also known as white walnut, and black walnut, pine, and black walnut. Black walnut is my favorite. But what I like, to, what I specialize in doing is putting family histories on it. So I got the idea when I was working on the uh, some a job for the Field Museum, and I did a uh, uh, first job was a replica of the uh, a small replica of that beaver pole they had out in front of the Field Museum. And then they cast that, and they were selling it out of the gift shop. And uh, they gave me a lot of books to read, and uh, different types of totem poles, or territorial poles, welcome poles, shame poles, you know, lots of neat things. But I really thought that they really had a family uh, theme going in the family pole. <coughs> Not only with their family, but the ancestors. Like this beaver pole started at the top. It's red from the top down. And these boys went off to study the beavers. And this was many generations before the family that was making the pole. And so what they did is uh, the other boys had to go back uh, home, and they left one of the boys there to observe the beavers. And they saw the beavers were brave. They were hard working, very ingenious how they built their dams and all that. So the top pictured uh, this boy looking through this hole. He was looking at the field museum. And that's what he was studying the beavers. So anyway, the story then went all the way down from there with the ancestors. Now all these ancestors and everything, beavers were their mascot, the family mascot. And they all took on the face of a beaver coming all the way down. And so then the story is told to the storyteller and the tribe. And so you can't look at the pole, and, you know, if you don't know the story, you're not going to discover the story on the pole. So the storyteller then uses the pole like an outline. So he looks at the pole and that reminds him, oh yeah, there was this ancestor and this ancestor. So his job is remember all the stories of everybody off their family pole and to tell the story. And to use that pole as an outline. Many other things were significant. The height of the pole had to be approved by the chief. The taller the pole, the better. And even if you put it up, if the chief thought it was too tall, Lop off some off the top, you know. Very informal. The chief had last say in everything, you know. So, but anyway, I adapted that theory to the mantles. Uh, so, what I do is I uh, do these history mantles and I get with the customers and uh, they give me their photographs. I put them in the frame of mind to think about these mantles are going to be around for hundreds of years. They aren't going to know what these things are. You know, you think back a hundred years ago and you look at some, like a house or something, you don't know where that came from. You'd like to know where it was, you know. So what I do is I say, let's put the house on and on the, the bottom here, let's have a little bit of piece of wood and I'll etch in the address and the location of this house. If we put a tractor, let's put the, like a John Deere uh, Model 370 or something like this here on the tractor. So they know what these things are a couple hundred years from now. 
Then on the ends, we put their family tree, their ancestors, their dates, and all of this on there, and all the way up to the current time. So they've really got some ownership. It's showing the either you know their things about them that they want to be remembered. Maybe it's their place of business, their hobbies, their house. Uh, sometimes it starts with their history, with the oldest history. Uh, maybe the wife starting with her history on this end, working in, and his husband's history on the other end, coming in the other side where they meet in the center. So there's really no rules other than, you know, let's just take and create a unique history, something to hand down. And most of the time, you start off with a customer, and they'll say, I don't have any history, you know. Well, let's get out the photo up. But pretty soon, before you know it, they're very enthused. They've got more history than you can fit on that now, you know. And so, but uh, that is, is really about 60% of my business then is making these family histories. And, uh, so that's really the heart of my business. And, uh, but uh, there's a big demand for it. And I really love doing that because that is something that I feel is going to be around for a long time. So, any other questions? Other questions? No, maybe I can ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a time for a test. <laughs> so, well, Joe, thanks a lot for your demonstration. It's been a pleasure. And again, this was made possible through the uh, Naperville Sunrise Club. You're all free to come to the next Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. This was great.